Let's talk about COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. What does this word mean? It means that there's a lung disease that takes a bit of time to develop. That's the word chronic. Obstructive means you're not able to breathe to a certain degree. Another name for COPD is emphysema. Some of the symptoms, there's quite a few. The most common ones are shortness of breath, coughing, mucus. The problem with COPD is it's a progressive condition that eventually leads to pulmonary hypertension. So you're getting blood pressure that's going up in your lungs, and it's going to put a lot of stress on the right ventricle. That's the right part of your heart. It's the pump that pushes all your blood to the entire body. So as you stress the right part of that pump, it's going to eventually weaken, and you'll start to get edema. You'll usually see that in your ankles. So if you see swelling in your ankles, then we know this is going on right here. Now, if we take a look at what's happening inside your lungs, you have these little pouches called alveoli. They look like little clusters of grapes, okay? Normally, they look like this. When you have COPD, they look like this. So you lose the shape of these little pouches uh, because there's a tremendous amount of irritation from either smoke or some other substance that's creating a constant inflammatory process. This word comes from the Latin word, which means uh, cavity, because it's a little pouch-like hole. Now, the purpose of the alveoli is just to exchange certain gases. It's pulling in CO2 from the blood, and it's adding into the circulation oxygen. So we have this exchange between oxygen and CO2. So you have this very, very thin uh, lining of the alveoli that allows this diffusion to take place. And right outside that thin layer, you have these tiny little blood vessels called capillaries. So we're really mixing in the oxygen with the blood. So it acts sort of like a carburetor. The carburetor is the lung of your engine, where you're actually pulling in oxygen, mixing it with fuel with the right ratio, a little spark plug, and creating energy. So the problem with COPD is this chronic irritation creates inflammation and something called oxidation. And oxidation is basically, it's like a rusting out effect of your, your body tissue. And the more that the body rusts out, it creates inflammation, and it's gonna try to heal incorrectly with too much scar tissue. We call that fibrosis. And so we get a thickening of this membrane. And when the membrane becomes thicker, you slowly lose your ability to exchange gases and get oxygen. So you have more difficulty breathing. So it's basically shutting off the oxygen to this carburetor right here. Now, one of the problem with this is that you're also getting a buildup of CO2, carbon dioxide, and that's gonna affect your breathing because you're breathing in something that's uh, mimicking additional smoke. It's just like not oxygen, it's just kind of like this other thing that's gonna um, irritate your lungs greatly. In summary, that's what COPD is. Now, what can you do about it? There's some really interesting research on this. And it has to do with this right here, oxidation. At the heart of COPD, you're getting a massive amount of oxidation. There just happens to be an antioxidant that can help stop this, maybe even reverse it. Some of the studies were done in animals, not in humans yet, but it makes sense that it would work in humans as well. And it has to do with a type of vitamin E. Now, most people might associate vitamin E with tocopherols, but fairly recently there was a, a, a type of vitamin E called tocotrienols, which is really in nature part of the vitamin E complex. So you have tocotrienols and you have tocopherols. The type of vitamin E that you would need to help reduce this oxidation would be the tocotrienols more than the tocopherols. So you want to get a supplement that has a dosage of about 300 milligrams okay, of tocotrienols only. Tocotrienols are 50 times stronger than the tocopherols. So it's going to really help you reduce this oxidation and other things that are very destructive in the lung tissue. So your inflammation is going to come way down with tocotrienols. And I would take uh, 300 milligrams, I would take that three times a day. 
on an empty stomach. So the goal with tocotrienols is to stop the oxidation inflammation so it doesn't turn into fibrosis. But if you think about vitamin E in general, what do people use it for? They use it for scarring, right? So you're reducing scar on the skin. Well, why not just take it internally to reduce scarring too? Not just in your lungs, but also in the liver. There's some great data on cirrhosis, but you can also use it on COPD to help break down some of the scarring in the lungs. Next remedy is vitamin D3. I would venture to say that 100% of patients with COPD are severely deficient in vitamin D. You have a lot of receptors for vitamin D in the lung. One of the treatments for COPD is steroids, okay, like prednisone and other, and other types of steroids that are like uh, bronchosteroid inhalers because steroids are anti-inflammatory. And vitamin D is the closest thing to that steroid cortisol that we're talking about. It acts like this anti-inflammatory, but without the side effects. It's a very powerful anti-inflammatory, but you have to take enough. So you want to take about 40,000 international units of vitamin D3 every single day. Okay, That's going to reduce inflammation and help you breathe. What intermittent fasting will do is drop your inflammation even more. The more frequent you eat, the more inflammation you're going to have in your body. The goal is to minimize the damage control and extend your life. So we want to really attack this right here as much as possible because this is causing this. Cause, effect. So fasting is going to be necessary. Periodic prolonged fasting. So a fasting of 72 hours, let's say every so often, maybe every two weeks, would greatly help you. Why? Because it's going to increase stem cells. Stem cells are cells that don't have a purpose yet. They're undifferentiated cells. They're kind of like basic cells that can turn into tissue, like any different type of tissue. So when you do prolonged fasting, your body will use these stem cells to replace um, the damaged tissue of your lungs. But not only that, it's going to stimulate something called autophagy. Autophagy is like a recycling action of your body. And autophagy recycles damaged proteins. Fibrosis is a protein. It's a scarring. It's going to help recycle and break that down and use that as energy and through its recycling, brand new tissue. So fasting will help the lungs in various ways. Dropping inflammation and actually correcting some of this damage through here as well. Number four, keto. The way you do keto is you drop your carbohydrates and then your body starts to switch over into ketones from fat fuel. Ketones are very anti-inflammatory. Again, another way to drop inflammation. Vitamin C, not synthetic, but from actual food or a food concentrate. Vitamin C is another powerful anti-inflammatory. And there's some additional studies, which I'll put down below, that shows that it'll increase your oxygen and decrease the CO2. So this is very important as well. OSHA root is a Native American Indian uh, remedy for lung disorders. So this is another great thing to consider right here. All right, what is the other problem with COPT? Usually people develop it from smoking and sometimes they are still smoking even though they've been diagnosed with this condition. So it's very, very difficult for certain people to give up smoking um, 100% because of its addictive qualities. And it's mainly from this chemical called nicotine, which I want to talk about now. Nicotine is interesting because it stimulates a part of the nervous system that relaxes you. It actually causes a, a stress reduction through your whole body. And in fact, it can help you breathe a little bit better. This is why when people go out and smoke, you can just see them calm down. They feel like they can finally breathe as they're breathing in all the smoke. The problem with nicotine, it, it comes with additional package of the extra smoke that's creating this right here. So ultimately, the goal would be to um, handle the addiction to that. At the cellular level, the receptors for nicotine have been altered to the point where they're downgraded. So a lot of the effects of feeling calm, um, stress relief, are now dependent on this thing right here. 
So unless you continually take in this nicotine, your stress level goes up, you might get slightly irritable, you might get angry, you might have depression. It can really affect your, uh, your brain. Nicotine also stimulates adrenaline. And adrenaline is interesting because adrenaline constricts the arteries except for two parts of your body. One is in the heart. The main artery of the heart is called the coronary. Nicotine actually opens up and vasodilates that artery, so it increases more blood flow to the heart. In the lungs, it creates a vasodilation effect. It opens up the lung tissue so you can breathe better. But everywhere else, it constricts the arteries. So that's a very unique thing about adrenaline. Well, nicotine increases adrenaline. The problem is, it kind of burns out your adrenals. So eventually, it's harder and harder to create that effect. So you need sometimes you need more and more nicotine to create that same effect to the point where you just don't have enough adrenaline in your body to keep your lungs open. So unless you're taking nicotine to try to kind of stimulate that, everything kind of shuts down. Nicotine also stimulates two other uh, chemicals in your body that greatly affect your mood and your pleasure. So sometimes if you don't smoke, these don't really work in your body, so your stress level goes up with that as well. The best way to handle any type of withdrawal symptoms or any type of addiction is to replace it with something else. So there's a couple things that I would recommend. There's something called Mormon tea. Now, there used to be um, this herb called Mei Hong that was available that you could take uh, for various things. Uh, it's, it was actually really good for the lungs, but it created other complications, so they banned it from the market. But Mormon tea has a kind of a mild effect of stimulating adrenaline, so it can actually help open up the lungs. It's very mild, but this could potentially act to give you some relief so the need for this can go down. Also, if you take a look at the withdrawal symptoms of nicotine, you have increased stress, nervous anxiety, and grouchiness or anger and things like that. Vitamin B1 counters that. So if you start taking B1 through the day, that will minimize the side effects. The last thing to realize about nicotine is that in order for the, the receptors to bounce back and reset, to go back to normal, could be between two to six weeks, okay? At the very latest. So realize that these withdrawal symptoms are only temporary, and if you can just stick it out for two to six weeks, it's gonna be a lot easier to completely handle this addiction right here. All right, in summary, I put all these things to do in the description down below. Check them out, and thanks for watching. Before you go, if you have a question about a product or you're new to keto and you wanna know how to begin keto, or you're on keto and you need a debug because it's not going as smooth, I have a keto consultant standing by to help you. This is just for the people in the US, Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to answer everyone's call. But I put the number down below so you can call and get some help.